Okay, apologies people online, you didn't miss much. Um, I'm just talking about um, pulsar timing arrays and where they're, where they're placed within the spectrum of gravitational waves. So uh, ground-based detectors are up here at higher frequencies of gravitational waves in the regime of say 100 Hertz to a kilohertz. Um, and they're targeting mostly compact binary in spirals where we're looking at neutron stars and stellar mass black holes of masses around uh, 100 solar masses. Uh, and below. Uh, at, at sort of middle frequencies here in the millihertz band, we've got uh, LISA, which will hopefully launch in about 12 years. It's a laser interferometer space antenna. So this is the space-based gravitational wave instrument where you've got three satellites separated by uh, about, a, well, I think it's 2.5 million kilometers on a side in a triangle. And that's trailing the orbit of the Earth. And that will be sensitive to massive black hole binaries um, of the scale of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 solar masses. So these are now sort of black holes that are in the centers of galaxies and uh, forming binary systems when the galaxies merge together. Um, we also get these interesting objects called extreme mass ratio in spirals. We hope these are when you've got uh, a much smaller black hole um, that will orbit a massive black hole and effectively act as a test mass in the space time of the larger black hole and trace that out and look for any deviations from GR um, that may be interesting to constrain. And then finally, down here at, at lower frequencies, um, at nanohertz to about 100 nanohertz, you've got the regime of pulsar timing arrays. Where we're actually using uh, effectively the entire galaxy as a big gravitational wave antenna. So we're an essential part of our detector um, are an ensemble of astrophysical objects themselves. We're actually using pulsars within the galaxy and timing them and trying to look for any deviations in the timing properties of those pulsars uh, as, a, as a sign of gravitational waves. Um, these are all kind of detection curves or sensitivity curves of the different instruments in characteristic strain. Uh, characteristic strain, um, I don't think I need to explain that much. It's just the uh, fractional deformation caused by gravitational waves. Yeah. Yeah, let me repeat the question. The question was, is there a lower frequency uh, bound for the sensitivity of pulsar timing arrays? Um, we're, we're essentially limited by how we sample the, the observations of the pulsars. So it's just kind of for your time series sampling considerations. If we've got 10 years of observations, then we're mostly just sensitive down to one over 10 years, which is about three nanohertz or so. Um, that's not to say we, we don't have any sensitivity below there but it's just diminishing returns if you try to go below, uh, below those frequencies. And the best way to extend that sensitivity is just to observe for longer. So we're now at the level where Nanograph has about 16 years of observations. Um, if we combine that with other pulsar timing arrays, we're not the only game in town. There's also collaborations around the world. And if we work together, we can extend that down to maybe uh, one nanohertz. So that's about 30 years of observations. And I haven't included the CNB down here um, but these are sort of the direct gravitational wave detection instruments. Okay, so this is a very skewed and inaccurate video of a gravitational wave propagating into our galaxy. Um, they don't show up as nice green grids, unfortunately, but they're interacting with, a, with an Earth pulsar line of sight. Here's the pulsar doing its thing. It's rapidly rotating. It's sending a, a beam of radiation towards us, and as it intersects our radio telescopes, we see this uh, pulse of radiation. So it's a, it's a cosmic lighthouse, essentially. Um, and whenever we've got a gravitational wave uh, sort of transiting this Earth pulsar line of sight, it's causing a change in the proper separation between Earth and pulsar. And so the pulses will either arrive earlier or later than our models, our best fit models of, of, those, uh, of those observations. Now, it would be grand if we could just look at this system and, uh, and just infer gravitational waves from one Earth pulsar system. Um, we would probably want to just look at our best timed pulsar, you know, the most exquisitely timed pulsar we could look at, and then try to see if there are any deviations from our models and ascribe that to gravitational waves. Unfortunately, we can't do that because these are messy astrophysical objects. Um, we don't have the luxury of, you know, uh, taking apart our detector like LIGO or even designing our detector precisely like LISA. Um, these are neutron stars. And there's much inside a neutron star that we don't understand. So we have to produce these effective noise models of the neutron stars. And even then, we could never really ascribe um, all of these influences to gravitational waves. So we don't rely on uh, individual pulsars, no matter how well they're timed. 
we use these arrays of pulsars. And what I'm showing down here are, um, this is, these are gravitational waves all over the sky. These are three pulsars that are responding to those gravitational waves. And because this is now an ensemble of gravitational wave sources, we get this stochastic time series because of all of the overlapping gravitational fixities. Um, and these pulsars are responding to the gravitational waves in a correlated way. Um, so there, there is information between these time, the correlations of these time series that we can use, that we can leverage to search for gravitational waves. So when pulsar timing arrays were predominantly interested in a stochastic gravitational wave background from many, many sources or from cosmological backgrounds, and we're looking at cross correlations between the different time series as a way to pull out that signal. Yeah. Um, what is it typical for a demonstrator to worry about? Right. Um, okay, so I, I will get onto this later on, and I'll. On, there, there's noise here because we've got a radio telescope. There's noise here, and then there's noise in here as well because we've got these radio pulses propagated to the interstellar medium. Um, over here, you've got um, the fact that these pulsars, they're, they're stable rotators. We're using millisecond pulsars, so they're more stable than the first pulsars that were detected, uh, but they're still not perfect, and they can wander uh, in their rotational period. They can wander in their phase over time. Um, that's, that's an important noise source for us because spectrally that looks very similar to the kind of gravitational wave signal we're hunting for. Um, and then there's all this you know, filthy interstellar medium stuff that we have to worry about as well that we have to model. So there's, there's many things that I'll talk about pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to understand this very, so much naive, but it's a little bit naive tutorial. Where are we most sensitive for the geographic wave passing right through the source, or is it sort of passing in the line of sight? Oh, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. So we're actually most, we're most sensitive to gravitational waves that are coming from this direction. So we have the greatest sensitivity around the sky location of the pulsar itself. Okay, and then we lose sensitivity um, in this orthogonal direction. Not entirely, but it's our minimal sensitivity. So if you... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The localization information for gravitational waves, as you may know, is pretty poor. Um, it's much more like a, you know, a slightly directional microphone than it is looking through a telescope. And so, for the first detections in pulsar timing arrays, the sky localization accuracy of, say, a threshold uh, individual source detection. I don't know. Um, will be hundreds to maybe a thousand square degrees. So that's a lot. That's a lot of the sky. And that's many, many galaxies that have to sit through. All right. So we're using an array of pulsars, hence a pulsar time array. Um, the kind of correlation signature that we're looking for is, is this shape here. We call it the Hellings and Downs curve. It was derived by uh, Hellings and Downs at JPL in the early 80s. And essentially, this is the correlation uh, signature that would be expected between pulsars that are separated by a certain angle on the sky um, when they respond into an isotropic Gaussian stationary stochastic background of gravitational waves. So this is the correlation in the time and arrival deviations that are caused by the gravitational waves. And it's mostly quadrupolar. You see this is going from zero to 180 degrees pulsar angular separation. It's mostly quadrupolar. Um, but it's not entirely quadrupolar. The reason why that is, is because um, there's actually a preferred direction, which is, is what you asked about. There's a preferred direction in the sky where we're more sensitive to gravitational waves close to our pulsar direction. So that kind of ruins the nice quadrupolar shape. And instead of coming back up to what it was over here, it actually goes to half of that level um, over at 180 degrees. But whenever we're talking about detection of pulsar time arrays, uh, you know, if we ever claim that we've got a, a detection of gravitational waves, it's based on teasing out the signature, um, which is why we haven't claimed detection yet. Uh, I'll talk about what we have claimed, but it's not detection yet. So we need many pulsars to do this experiment. Uh, there are lots of people doing this. Um, so I'm a member of the Nanograph Collaboration, which has in its data sets uh, information from the Green Bank Telescope, that's in West Virginia. There's also Arecibo, rest in peace, uh, because it's 
in case you didn't know, it's actually uh, it collapsed about a year and a half ago, I think, um, it was a year and a half ago. But we still have information that's useful from our receiver. Because we're looking at such low frequency signals, this is going to be an important anchor in our data sets for many years to come. Uh, there's also the European Pulsar Timing Array, um, which this is only a, this is only a a smattering of some of the telescopes that it has access to. This, I think this is Joggle Bank in the UK, uh, possibly Westerbork in the Netherlands. Uh, we've also got the Parks Pulsar Timing Array in Australia, and then uh, newly joined in uh, the International Pulsar Timing Array is the Indian Pulsar Timing Array. So they've now joined this effort using uh, GMRT. Um, there are also other timing campaigns around the world. There's, um, there's the Near Time Project, uh, which uses data from Meerkat. It's a precursor to the Square Kilometer Array. And then there's also FAST, the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope in China. Uh, that's just amazing at hunting for pulsars. And we all work together in the International Pulsar Timing Array. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, our receiver was gone, but it will be, continue to be an important anchor uh, in our data sets. All right. So, um, Going back to this question of frequency sensitivity, the reason why we're accessing these lower frequency uh, regimes uh, of the gravitational wave landscape is how we're sampling the pulsars. Essentially, um, we will look at a pulsar with our telescopes for about 20 to 30 minutes. And within that time, we're looking at many, many rotations, or many, many uh, pulses, and we average over that 20 to 30 minute observation. Um, that gives us uh, what we call an epoch averaged pulse. Um, that's one data point for us. Okay, And then a few weeks later, we'll go back to that same pulsar and look again. We'll do that repeatedly over 10, 20 years, as long as we want. It doesn't have to end. We just keep timing it. And so just from standard time series analysis considerations, we're sensitive to one over the observation baseline. That gets us down to a few nanohertz. And then uh, if we're looking at something every couple of weeks, then by night with sampling, that gets us to uh, a few hundred nanograms. So that's the that's the space we're looking at, and in this frequency regime where we expect um, to dominate our population of supermassive black hole binaries. So these are the most massive black holes in the universe uh, that are just built up over time as galaxies merge together. Okay, and so the, these are the supermassive black holes that live in the center of galaxies, and they merge together actually quite often over cosmic time, and they produce this ensemble gravitational wave signal. That we're trying to measure. Um, the spectral model, the characteristic strain spectral model for that supermassive black hole binary signal is actually really, really simple to compute. Um, you can do it on the back of an envelope. I have my uh, grad students do it in the first year just to get a feel for how to compute these things. It's, it's really, really simple. It's just an F to the minus two thirds power law in, in characteristic strain. Okay, and this is assuming that uh, we've got a a large population of supermassive black hole binaries that are evolving purely due to the emission of gravitational waves. There could be other messy astrophysics that is affecting them at large orbital separations, because these, after all, are binaries that are embedded in uh, complex astrophysical environments, surrounded by gas, potentially, or interacting with stars. Um, but that would impact it at lower frequencies. At higher frequencies, we're still looking at an F to the minus two thirds power law. And if we look at the power spectral density of the timing deviations that are caused by the gravitational waves, then uh, that just translates to another uh, strain squared divided by F cubed for us. And that's why in a lot of our papers, you might see us looking for an F to the minus 13 thirds spectrum. So we're looking at the same thing here. This is just characteristic strain or the power spectral density of the timing deviations that are caused by the gravitational waves. So what's new? Um, we were producing upper limits for a long, long time. Um, and we were getting interesting science out of those. We were placing constraints on the supermassive black hole binary population. Um, but what's new is that we seem to have gone beyond uh, placing upper limits to now detecting something. And that's something uh, what we're calling that is a common spectrum process or a common red process. Um, for us, just a red process is something that has uh, power on long time scales in our time series. So it's a predominantly low frequency signal. And it appears to be spectrally common across the observations of all our pulsars. Now, we don't have 
evidence in the cross correlations. We don't have that nice Ellings and Downs shape that goes mostly quadrupolar. But if we take a sort of Bayesian periodogram, a Bayesian power spectrum of our observations, then we find that there is a tilt upwards at lower frequencies. And that upwards tilt is common to the vast majority of our pulsars. Um, so these are the these are the kinds of objects that you might be interested in fitting your own models to. These are just this is just a Bayesian periodogram. Okay. Instead of points and error bars, these are Bayesian posterior distributions on effectively the, the power spectral density of timing deviations at different frequencies. So down here, this is one over about 13 years of observations. So that's getting us down into the regime of about two nanohertz. And the the fatter this little violin is here. Uh, means that those regimes are, are are more probable, okay? And so this is a good detection of that common red process. This is a good detection. This actually looks like it might be consistent with, with, uh, with zero, uh, but there is still some power extending upwards. And, and you get the idea. We've got many, many of these, and we can easily just replace these by points and error bars. Um, but this is how we produce our spectrum. Um, We've got this big spike over here at uh, 32 nanohertz. Does that frequency mean anything to anyone in the room? 32 nanohertz, roughly. Okay, that's that's one over a year. And the reason why uh, the reason why pulsar time intervals don't have sensitivity to one over a year is because um, we still have to fit out um, a deterministic timing model of the pulsar's behavior. And part of that is, is fitting for its sky location. And fitting for its sky location actually remove sensitivity to one over a year. Uh, we also get dimish, diminished sensitivity at one over six months uh, to fit for proper motion of the pulsars. We also have to fit for that uh, intrinsic instability in the pulsars, which removes some of our sensitivity at lower frequencies as well. Uh, but we can still measure this common spectrum uh, red process amongst the pulsars at lower frequencies. Um, we've done a lot of different tests of different uh, models uh, against these these Bayesian periodograms. Um, we can fit you know, just straightforward power laws, but what we found if we fit power laws across all of this spectrum is we're actually affected by some white noise level, some flat power spectral density level over here that might just be due to unmodeled systematics in the pulsars. Um, so we don't, we only, we only uh, allow there to be a power law across a certain number of low frequencies, which then flattens out. And then where it transitions, um, is at about five frequencies. That's why in our papers and in a lot of the results, a lot of the papers that have used the results, um, they're only fit into five of these uh, frequencies because that's where we seem to be seeing this common spectrum process rise above the noise level and actually emerge at the lower frequencies. If we do fit a power law to these lowest five frequencies, um, then the amplitude of the spectral index of that power law translates to this posterior distribution. Um, you know, this, these are uh, 13 thirds would be about 4.33. So that's giving you an idea of where we expect the supermassive black hole binary background to, to intersect this, this two dimensional posterior. Um, it's consistent. Um, however, it does seem like we've got a, a steeper red process than, than expected. Um, it's not really intention, um, but it is, it is something we have to consider. And the amplitude of this common spectrum process does seem to be at the higher levels um, predicted by models of supermassive black hole binary populations. It's not intention, but it is still at the higher levels of, of predictions. And if this, this green posterior distribution here, you don't need to worry about it. This is what I was talking about. If you just try to you know, fit a power law across all of these frequencies and you contaminate yourself, then you'll actually be shallower. So this gets more and more shallow, uh, the lower in gamma you get until just a flat power spectral density would be consistent with zero. So we only focus on these lower frequencies and we get this red tilted spectrum. Um, this amplitude in characteristic strain space is usually referenced to that frequency of one over a year. Why on earth would we, would we do that? Great question, historical precedent. We have no sensitivity at one over a year, yet we reference all of our strain uh, constraints to one over a year. So go figure, I don't know why. Um, but you can easily translate that back to what the amplitude is at uh, the lowest frequencies if you want to, just given the model. Um, like I said, we, had, we don't have any evidence yet 
of the Helens and Downs correlations. These are just uh, binned measurements of our cross correlations. This is from an earlier data set. It looks rather messy. It's consistent with kind of zero correlations. But in the 12 and a half year data set, the one that, I'm, that I've been talking about, um, for sure, we don't have the quadrupolar correlation. We don't have that Helens and Downs shape. However, the uncertainties are starting to get smaller. And so you'd imagine as time goes on, we'll be able to discriminate and say one way or the other whether this is consistent with that Helens and Downs curve in blue or some other systematic that might produce just a flat correlation, dipole correlation. Um, so we don't know yet. And uh, over here, this is just Bayesian equivalent of this kind of test, um, but we're actually trying to recover the bend correlations as part of our big Bayesian search. And again, um, this is not yet consistent to, to high significance with the Helens and Downs correlation curve. Um, in fact, the Bayesian odds of Helens and Downs correlations in this data set was about two or four to one. So it's, man, you wouldn't, you wouldn't write home about that. It's not very significant. You only start to care about odds ratios in Bayesian analyses when there may be 100 to 1, and we're definitely not there yet. What's great is that Nanograv is not now the only collaboration to have measured this common red process, or common spectrum process. I keep flipping back and forth between those. Um, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array in Australia has measured this common spectrum process as well. And um, the spectral properties of that seem to be consistent with what Nanograv has found. So that's that periodogram that the PPTA has found, and that's the equivalent of their power law fit. Yep. It's a great question. So the question was, are the different um, telescopes looking at different pulsars? Some of them are, but we have a huge amount of overlap in the pulsars we observe too. Um, that's that's both a blessing and a curse. We can we can cross check our results and you know check our noise models. Um, but it doesn't give us a completely independent array of pulsars. Um, that's fine because the telescopes are completely independent. Um, so the, the noise in those telescopes are completely different. Um, however, the Parks has almost unique access to the Southern Hemisphere. And so they've got many pulsars that Nanograv and the European Pulsar Timing Array can't access. And so that's another way that we would advocate to combine all of our data together because then you've got better coverage of pulsars in the sky and for better response to gravitational waves from different parts of the sky. Uh, the Europeans have also found this common spectrum process, which, which is very nice. Again, uh, consistency in the properties of that spectrum with what Nanograv discovered. And if we do this uh, exercise where we combine all of our data sets, um, we're actually, we actually combine obsolete data sets, so previous data sets to see if um, the combination would be stronger than you know the, the the latest data sets from each collaboration. And then we did find again this common spectrum process um, that was consistent amongst all of the different subarrays that were in that combined data set. So everyone's agreeing that there's something there. Um, none of us have measurements of the cross correlations, and so now the hunt is on to to actually look in our data sets to see whether those correlations were there. And I'll talk more about that um, pretty soon. So we're now in this regime where we've, we've gone beyond just placing upper limits on the strength of gravitational waves to finding something that could be the first sign of gravitational waves. I said could be, so it could just be that um, because this is such a low frequency signal, detection is not an instantaneous event. Um, it's a narrative that happens over a period of time and there are milestones along the way. This could be that first milestone. We found this common spectrum process where the cross correlation would follow. Um, some years afterwards. Um, what could this common spectrum process be? Could it be gravitational waves? Well, we don't have uh, those cross correlations, so we have to wait and see. Um, is it consistent with supermassive black hole binaries? Yes, but it's consistent with many things. Um, and the amplitude does appear toward the high end of astrophysical models. So again, it's a wait and see, um, but we don't have to wait long, hopefully. And could this really just be a conspiracy of similar noise in the different pulsars. Perhaps there's something common about instabilities in, in pulsars that produces noise that's spectrally similar. And um, the way to rule that out would be to find these cross correlations. This is, uh, you know, you, you, you kill two birds with one stone here. If you find the cross correlations, you know that it's gravitational waves, and also you know that it's not a conspiracy of similar noise just in the individual pulsars. 
So the road ahead for supermassive black hole binaries, at least, is that we expect we'll get a measurement of those cross correlations, which will give us gravitational wave background in a year to two, I would say. Um, then hopefully we'll start to get electromagnetic detections of, of supermassive black hole binaries from large optical time domain surveys, as might be conducted in the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, so that, that has the legacy survey of space and time, which will hopefully be able to look at periodic quasars and some explanation of periodic quasars is that they're actually supermassive black hole binaries. Um, PTAs will then hopefully start to resolve individual binaries out of the gravitational wave confusion pattern. After that, we might even get some overlap in those gravitational wave and the um, signals and get a multi-messenger supermassive black hole binary. That would be incredibly exciting, something I'm very excited about. Um, and then you start to get into characterization of the entire binary population. And by that time, Lisa launches and, and we'll get uh, measurements of lower mass as a black hole binaries. Um, but uh, I, I suspect that not many people in the room are that interested in binaries. They're more interested in fundamental physics. Do you have a question? Sure. Uh, on the line. Yeah. Can you comment on, uh, I mean, how much of the road is just, you know, taking data for longer and how much of it is that you're actually going to get new instruments or new techniques? Um, a lot of it is taking data for longer. And and uh, the, the strategy we have is we keep timing the pulsars we have, but we also add new pulsars. So there's a continual sequence of surveys for new pulsars in, in good locations on the sky. And they have to be assessed for their quality, their timing quality. If they're good enough, then after about three years of being observed, they will be added to our array. And so if you look at Nanograph's earliest data sets, we had about 18 millisecond pulsars. We had time for five years. That was our first data set. Um, we used the same number for our nine year data set. And then in our uh, 11 year data set, we had 34. In our 12 and a half, we had 45. Now we're actually in Nanograph's most recent data set that we're still preparing. We're going to have about 65 to 70 pulsars. So it's really growing. And at, that, at those levels, uh, prospects for, for getting those cross correlations are really good. Um, hopefully, though, we'll have something that will eventually replace our SIBO. Um, one prospect is actually the DSA 2000, the Deep Synoptic Array. Um, that is, it's meant to be a large synoptic uh, array somewhere in Nevada. That will be 2,000 radio receivers spread across this valley um, doing a, a radio time survey. And also a lot of it is going to be spent on nanograph pulsar timing. So that will be the kind of thing that will come online, hopefully, um, by the mid to end of this decade. Okay, so pulsar timing arrays also have um, the benefit of being responsive to you know, lots of different Earth pulsar lines of sights, which means that we can intersect uh, the gravitational wave metric perturbation along different lines of sight, which gives us good sensitivity um, to different polarization states. So in, in GR, we've got two polarization states of gravitational waves, uh, commonly called plus and cross polarizations. But in a uh, more general metric theory of gravity, you can have six polarization states some of those are actually no longer transverse, they're, they're longitudinal. And pulsar timing arrays have huge sensitivity to longitudinal modes of gravitational waves. Um, in fact, it, it really, it, it's logarithmic uh, in frequency and, and this is L, this is the pulsar distance. So if we can get, um, if we can get a, quite a distant pulsar and uh, look at it at reasonable frequencies, then we get a huge response to uh, this is the scalar longitudinal mode of gravitational waves. This is the vector longitudinal mode. And these are describing equivalent um, equivalent things to that Hellings and Downs curve, uh, just looking at low angular separations. And low angular separations of pulsars is, is best for looking for these longitudinal modes of gravitational waves. So we have these searches ongoing, um, and we've produced many constraints already on uh, different polarization states from modified gravity. Um, we've never actually searched for um, the mass of the graviton or, or something like the speed of gravitational waves in these different polarization states, uh, but that is something we can do in the future because that, that correlation curve changes if you've got subluminal modes of gravitational waves as well. 
Um, so it's something we could parameterize and search for, or you could do that as well. Um, obviously, this is probably the most interesting sequence of slides for you all. Um, we're looking for cosmological phase transitions as well. We've got a small uh, group of people in our collaboration that are, that are looking at this. Um, this analysis that I'm talking about here, which is the nanograph 12 and a half year phase transition search, was led out of Caltech by uh, Catherine Zurich's group uh, that included Andrea Mitrodati, who's a postdoc at Caltech, and uh, some of Catherine's uh, graduate students, and I was in the analysis team as well. And obviously, we're sensitive to gravitational wave frequencies that are way below the electroweak transition scale. And so the proposition has been that we could be sensitive to dark sector transitions. Um, so the spectral modeling has been relatively straightforward and, and, and simple. Um, we, we've got these parameters that, look, that are, can, we can look for the peak of some sort of phase transition gravitational wave spectrum. Um, I think this equation has probably been presented before in this, in this meeting. Um, but this is the temperature of the phase transition. This is the bubble nucleation rate, um, number of relativistic degrees of freedom at the phase transition, and then uh, the equivalent gravitational wave frequency at the phase transition time itself. And all of this just shifts around the peak of the gravitational wave spectrum from phase transitions to lower and higher frequencies. So um, obviously we made a non-detection, otherwise you know, we would have heard about it. Um, the, we, can at least constrain that this dark sector phase transition, if that's where it is, would be below about 10 mega electron volts. Uh, the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array has uh, conducted their own phase transition search using their data, and uh, they're sensitive again below about one to 100 mega electron volts. So that's the kind of um, transition scale that we can constrain at these low frequencies. Um, and hopefully, you know, you might be able to confront our observations with your own models if you have them. Uh, these are some results from the paper itself, the nanograph uh, paper. Um, the analysis was done with uh, models that included just bubble collisions only, and then only sound waves from the phase transition. Um, there were some simplistic models, then semi-analytic models, then numerical models. Um, these are all kind of the best fit curves that come from these different scenarios. These little uh, violins are the first five. One, two, three, four. Yeah, first five from that, um, that nanograph Bayesian periodogram, the Bayesian power spectrum that I showed you way earlier. Uh, and so in this analysis, we just fit against those first five frequencies and got some constraints. Now, we didn't just assume that all of this uh, common spectrum process was due to phase transitions, but that would be uh, a little bit silly. What we, what we did do though was assume that it's a perturbation to the supermassive black hole binary signals. We searched for both simultaneously and we get this joint constraint on the amplitude of the astrophysical background from the binaries. And then this is the strength of the phase transition of the star. Um, there's not a huge amount of covariance here because the spectral shapes are quite different. Um, phase transition gives this nice rise and peak and fall off, whereas gravitational wave spectrum from binaries is just this power level. Um, we can also search for different signatures of dark matter. Um, one of the signals we look for is um, scalar field dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, um, which should produce this very distinctive um, spike at, uh, at a frequency that could be related to the mass of the dark matter particle uh, for this ultralight dark matter. And fuzzy dark matter has been proposed as um, solving problems in lambda CDM where, there's, um, where lambda CDM predicts too much structure on, on small scales. And so fuzzy dark matter could resolve that. Um, again, again, we're searching for this as a correction to what we think will be the dominant gravitational wave signal from binaries, not just assuming that this is the only signal. And uh, another signal we can get from dark matter is just through substructure. We have got these photons propagating through um, space that may include dark matter subhalos. And so we can, um, along the way, we'll get some, some imprint on the actual time observations that we constrain with uh, many, many pulsars and many, many uh, you know, observations over decades. Okay, I think we've reached a natural break and I can answer uh, any questions and then go into the data analysis interlude. Are there any questions before I talk about the nitty gritty details of how we do our analysis?
Sorry, I had a quick question. Yeah. When you were showing the fuzzy dark matter. Yeah. So what's the difference that I'm supposed to look at between the, the two? So the, the difference is that um, it's just the kind of structure that cold dark matter predicts. Yeah. Um, but when confronting up actual observations, there's too much structure in this theory. Um, and, and fuzzy dark matter has been proposed as one way to resolve that. It smooths out structure. Oh, smoother, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure this is highly dependent on the model assumed. And what would be really nice would be to have um, kind of a gallery of different assumptions and just go through them one by one and see how those affect um, the constraints. I'm, I'm sure these are highly model dependent. I'm not necessarily advocating for this particular sequence of models. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, you can see, you can see that these are the these are the best fit um, spectral curves from these different models, and they're very different. So you tweak one thing, and it, it makes a big difference. Um, but this this is kind of a rough scaling relationship for at least where that peak should lie. So if we've got a sequence of our actual observations show a nice peak. Um, like a rise and fall in our spectrum, then we can at least fit against that. That seems to be something that, you know, whereas the tilt on both sides of that peak can vary quite a lot. I think the, the position of the peak in terms of these parameters is more robust. And then we could interrogate it and then go below the peak, if the peak on both sides. Absolutely, yeah. The, the question earlier was what um, affects the, the lower frequency sensitivity. And it's mostly just how long we've timed all of these pulsars. So naturally, just because we're building longer data sets, we'll get lower and lower. So at the moment, this search is mostly the Sure. Yeah. Um, so this, this is about what, two nanohertz. But as we get lower, this is about 30 years of observations. It gets more challenging to get below there, but it's not it's not out of the realm as possible. Pulsar timing arrays are, are uh, they're, they're the most cost-effective gravitational wave search, I think, because we're piggybacking on existing radio telescopes. We don't have to build these billion-dollar experiments. We're going to time pulsars anyway because they're beautiful astrophysical objects that has other science. So, you know, most bang for your buck. Okay. Yes. The dark matter structure component. Is there something we can do with the stochastic signal, or is this something that we need to be able to see individual binary black hole parts? Um, no, this has got nothing to, to do with the individual. This is not a, I should mention, neither of these are gravitational wave signals. Mm -hmm. These are just, you know, this is some time varying galactic potential. And then this is just photons propagating through space time close to dark matter subfields. So this, these would be nothing to do with you know, individual binary searches. We'd probably look for this, you know, since it's propagating nearby multiple dark matter subhalos. I imagine it would be some sort of stochastic component we would try to search within. Um, we can easily model these as individual events as well. Though. Okay. So now would be a good time, if you want to, if you'd like to participate in this tutorial, now would be a good time to transition over to the Google Collaboratory link that I sent in, um, okay. in the Slack yesterday. Okay. Uh, if you're not on Slack, you also want to see the Oh, perfect. Okay. All right. Thanks for doing that. Okay, so this is what it'll look like when you open it up. Um, our, our search software is called Enterprise. It's a tortured acronym. I'm responsible for that. Um, but some of us are Star Trek nerds and we wanted to call our software Enterprise. Um, and all of this will just uh, operate within uh, a Google Collaboratory server. You don't have to install any software on your own machine. It also shouldn't save. Um, so if you go to a different page or you shut down your computer, and um, your work thus far will be will not be saved. Yep. 
it's entirely up to you. If you take it out of playground mode, it might ask you to uh, make your own copy. Um, yeah, I would make your own copy if you want the changes to be saved. And I don't think you'll be working on on my particular copy here. Um, I think it should be unique to, to you. When you open it. While you're all doing that, I'll start talking about some of the actual practical details of searching and pulsar time array. Um, so you're not meant to read this, but you are meant to see that there's a huge sequence of operations that take us from the actual emission of the pulsar down to where we do our searches for gravitational waves. Uh, we've got you know, the pulsar is rotating. It's sending out beams of radio waves through the ionized interstellar medium, which means that lower radio frequencies will arrive uh, later than, than higher radio frequencies, and that leads to dispersion. So we have to correct for interstellar medium-driven dispersion when we get these, these radio pulses. Once we do that, we still have to take into account that an individual pulse shape from, from one radio pulse looks like an absolute mess. It doesn't look like something we could fit against. And so we average over many, many pulsars, uh, pulses uh, within about a 20 minute observing epoch. Once we average, we get this nice reproducible pulse profile. So this would be in, in pulse phase space. This is the kind of fingerprint of one particular pulsar. Um, that gives us one observation, and then we've recorded that pulse shape from previous observations, and that's our template. We convolve that observation with the template, and we get a phase offset that um, we can convert then to a timing offset, and that gives us time of arrival for that particular pulse or, or sequence of pulses. And we do this over many weeks, years, decades, and we get this um, long stretch pulsar timing data. Um, along the road, we also build up a nice model for when we expect the pulses to arrive. And that's based on our growing knowledge of behavior of pulsar. So we create something called a timing ephemeris. The timing ephemeris is the model of behavior of the pulsar. If we make a good timing solution, if we describe the pulsar well, then once we fit out our model from the actual timing observations, we should just get Gaussian noise that's consistent with zero. Okay, these are the timing residuals. What you get when you take your observations and you fit off your, your best for timing model. If we have a bad model, something that doesn't take into account the fact that the pulsar's rotational period is changing over years, then we'll get this long quadratic drift. So that's a bad timing model. If we goofed on where our pulsar is on the sky, then we'll get this sinusoidal behavior um, with a frequency of a year, one over a year. If we haven't taken into account proper motion of that pulsar, then we'll get this expanding envelope sine wave um, with, I think this is about one over six months. So these are all telltale signs that we've made a mistake in constructing our timing solution. And we do need a good timing solution so that we can search within these, these um, timing residuals for the presence of gravitational waves. We're looking for gravitational wave perturbations that are much, much smaller than these leading order effects. So let's move on to the, the actual notebook. Okay, so what this notebook and what this, is, um, what this graphic is showing is kind of the chain of different assumptions and components that go into our, our data analysis model. Uh, we've got some white noise. White noise is just a noise that's flat in power spectral density of those timing residuals. Um, the, the most obvious thing there is that we have uncertainty on the actual arrival times of these observations. And so that's, that's part of our model. We also have these, you don't need to worry about what these exactly mean, but these are essentially fudge factors that correct for the fact that sometimes we've underestimated or overestimated the uncertainty on our uh, arrival times. We've also got this red noise. Um, the red noise is noise that's, um, has more power on lower frequencies, lower gravitational wave frequencies or lower frequencies of the time series. And for each pulsar, there's an individual uh, red noise process, Gaussian process, um, that takes into account stochastic drift in its period behavior, its emission behavior. Um, so that's a model that goes per pulsar. Then we've got um, the gravitational waves, which ideally are correlated across all of the pulsars. And then there's 
you know, pesky other systematics that we have to take into account. And one of these that's worth talking about is the solar system ephemeris. And that's where we have to correct our timing observations from where we actually measure them on the Earth to the quasi-inertial reference frame of the solar system barycenter. And obviously the solar system barycenter is not a physical position. It depends on us having uh, a good idea of the masses and the trajectories of the important dynamical objects in the solar system. And if we do that incorrectly, then we'll get potentially a correlated dipolar signature between our pulsars. So instead of it looking at the Hellings and Downs curve, it would just look like a dipole in the angular separation between pulsars. So that's when we would know that we've goofed and we've made a mistake, we've introduced some sort of ephemeris errors. And the reason why this is important to talk about is because a few years ago we realized we'd approached this, this noise floor where we were sensitive to the particular solar system ephemeris models that JPL had constructed. JPL are the ones who construct these models of the solar system ephemeris um, based on spacecraft data, on ranging data. And um, we were now at the level where we could, we could actually be sensitive to the differences in those models that they produce every couple of years. And we've reached a level now where we think with the inclusion of Juno data that's updated uh, some of Jupiter's parameters, we think we're at the level where this is no longer going to trouble us. But it's, it was an interesting aspect where I actually led the analysis where we found this, uh, we found, we discovered Jupiter. Who would have thought, right? <laughs> um, because we had 11.4 years of observations and Jupiter has an orbital period of about 11 point something years. And so obviously it was starting to affect us. Uh, we shouldn't have to worry about this for too much long or for, for a while longer because the next one over is Saturn. Saturn has an orbital period of about 30 years. Um, all of these assumptions are piped into our likelihood, including this model of the, the behavior of each pulsar. Um, that includes how fast it's spinning and you know, propagation effects to the ISM, the interstellar medium. A lot of these pulsars are in binary systems. And so we have to build a binary model for each of these pulsar systems. That has to be taken into account. Um, some of these pulsar binary systems are just fantastic for doing tests of, of theories of gravity anyway. So they're, they're constructed very carefully. All of this goes into the big grinder that is our likelihood that you're going to use pretty soon. We do a big Bayesian MCMC analysis, and then we try to constrain astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, that's more of the formal Bayesian network if you're interested, but we can, we can skip past this right now. Okay. So if you're at the level where you're actually at this, um, this cell, just go ahead and execute that. Don't worry about it. Um, it'll take maybe about 60 seconds. Okay, and don't worry if it says your kernel has crashed or your session has crashed, it's fine. Um, once that's done, import con colab, that looks like it's okay. And then all of the software you'll need pretty much um, can be installed using this one line. And if you've never used Mamba before, it's kind of a, a parallelized version of Anaconda for Python. Fantastic, it speeds this up. Instead of this taking 15 minutes to install, it, it should take about 90, seconds or, or two minutes. And while that's working, let me talk through some of the other aspects of the model. Um, so we model our vector of, of time and observations as having some deterministic component and then some stochastic component. Um, we're interested in the residuals once we subtract off our best fit description of the pulsar's behavior. Um, so the deterministic parts of this would be that time in ephemeris, that model of the pulsar's behavior. There could also be transient noise features that we can model deterministically or hopefully individually resolvable gravitational wave signals. So we can do match filtering just like LIGO does or LISA will do 
uh, to pull out deterministic signals. Um, but we think that the, the dominant first signal will be stochastic. This will be an interpulsar correlated achromatic process. Achromatic or chromatic here is referring to the radio frequency dependence, okay? So there are two frequencies in everything I'm saying. Uh, I'm mostly talking about the gravitational wave frequency, which are sort of the fluctuation sampling frequencies of the time series of our observations. But there can also be a radio frequency dependence in some of this noise because of the propagation of the radio pulses through the ionized interstellar medium. So there could be noise that's per pulsar. There could be drift in the column density of electrons between the Earth and the pulsar, which will lead to some drift in some of these ISM effects. Um, so all of these have to be modeled in some way. It's a giant, what we call a global fit, similar to the kind of global fit that Lisa will do, where it's searching for every signal and every noise characteristic at the same time. So our, the dimensionality of our search is uh, in the several hundreds explicitly and implicitly, if you in include things that we analytically marginalize over, uh, it's in thousands of dimensions. Um, so here's just a graphic showing that we've got radio pulses propagating through the ionized interstellar medium. That's an important noise source that we have to take into account. So let's go back and see if this is finished. Okay. Two, two minutes, not bad. Okay, and then we're going to grab all of the data that we'll be using from this GitHub repository. This is put together by Aaron Johnson, who was a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, um, but is moving to Caltech pretty soon as a postdoc. Okay, so now we've got everything we'll need, and we're just going to search within the data we've downloaded, which is Nanograv's 12.5 12, year data set. Um, there will be 45 pulsars in this data set. We're not going to use them all. In fact, we'll just focus on one of them because otherwise this, um, this would take the rest of the afternoon. Um, so I'll just give you an idea of how you can do this with one pulsar and the extension to use multiple pulsars is trivial. I'll tell you how to do that. So this next cell is just going to read in our software enterprise and uh, some other useful things. The data structures we look at and, and that we're going to read in are, um, first of all, I'll, I'll look at this one first. This is the adopt Tim file. So this contains all of the actual time and observations of the pulsar. This would be you know, the actual data file of the time and observations. The PAR files are um, some metadata that describe the pulsar's deterministic time and model. So um, things that we have to take into account, like it's period, it's period derivative, um, where it is on the sky, um, how much dispersion measure has it been experiencing because of the interstellar medium, lots of other things like that. And this PAR file will contain uh, an initial fit of the timing model. But the thing about our analysis is that we're going to vary that those timing model parameters at the same time. So we're only using an initial you know, good position that the radio astronomers have given us but we're going to marginalize over that timing model at the same time that we do our gravitational wave search. So we don't, we don't hold anything fixed here. We, uh, we're going to search over everything. Um, if you did want to search over, say, most of the important pulsars, then these are the important pulsars you would look at. They have more than six years of timing data, which gets you below 10 nanohertz of sensitivity. One over six years is about five nanohertz, I think. Uh, one over six years, yeah. So if you did want to use many pulsars and, and do an analysis with those, um, this would be the sequence to use. However, that would take quite a while. Um, this is just accessing the data directory, and then we're going to grab all of those PAR files, the parameter files of the pulsars. We'll grab the timing files, the actual data files. Um, we'll read all of those in. And they're read in, in the correct order, so they're matched up. The parameter file for one pulsar should match the, the actual timing data file for another pulsar. Then we create these, um, these pulsar objects, which hold all of the information we need for doing a particular analysis. So once you create a pulsar object instance for each of these um, distinct pulsars, your job with the data files is done. You don't need them anymore. You're just dealing with Python objects. And they contain things that are pre-computed, like important matrix quantities, 
uh, or important calculations that you don't want to do when you're running your Bayesian analysis. They're done at the start to get them out of the way and then they're just cached. So this is going to then read in those PAR files and the TIM files of one particular pulsar. This is a particularly important pulsar, uh, J1909-3744. It's a very sensitive, well-timed pulsar. So we're just going to focus on that. But if you wanted to load in all of the pulsars, you would just get rid of this line. That's all you would need to do. So this will take about 30 seconds, because like I said, it's doing some operations that are useful for later on. It's caching some quantities. If you did remove this line and you read in all of the pulse stars, then you may notice you get some outputs that have warnings that say, uh, this pulsar doesn't have a distance that we can associate it with, or we don't know what the distance is to this pulsar. Um, that's fine. We don't know the distance to many pulsars very well, at least. Um, we know that they're, you know, about, we know their distance to within maybe 20%. Um, there are some pulsars that we have, maybe one pulsar actually, we have subparsec distance precision on, but that's rare. Most of these, we don't know their distances. And in fact, mostly that doesn't matter. Um, because we're we're only correlating one part of the gravitational wave induced signal, and that's the part where the gravitational wave is actually jiggling the Earth, not where it's jiggling the pulsar. So we don't need to know about this uh, the the pulsar distance that well. Okay, so that's now uh, formed a pulsar object. This long line here, uh, this long cell, is going to find all of the unique uh, radio receivers and the different timing software that is um, being used in uh, more than a decade of observations of this. And it'll produce a color-coded plot of the timing residuals for this one pulsar. So in this one pulsar, the total length of observations is about 12.7 years. Uh, these are those timing residuals. It looks like we haven't made a mistake in forming that timing solution. It's kind of nice and flat and uh, distributed around zero. Um, so this implies that the gravitational wave signals we're looking for are very small. They're, they're really, really dug in here at the sub microsecond level. In fact, we're looking at signals that are at the level of timing offsets of about 10 to 100 nanoseconds, okay? So these are all just different radio receivers um, over time. This is a modified Julian date, so this probably goes back to about 2005. That's when Nanograph started taking observations. And the scale here of the timing residuals are microseconds. Now, we said we weren't going to hold uh, anything fixed. That was a little bit of a fib. We're going to hold um, some white noise characteristics that are not going to impact our gravitational wave searches that much. We're just going to hold them fixed. Um, and we hold them fixed based on the fact that we've previously searched over them in uh, characterizing individual pulsars. So we do a sequence where we analyze the noise properties of individual pulsars. We find out some noise characteristics, and then we hold those fixed. Um, so this is going to read, on a, read in a JSON file that um, is the actual measured noise properties from these pulsars, all of the pulsars. So likewise, if you wanted to include all of the pulsars in your analysis, it's all within this dictionary. And now we're at the stage where we're going to piece together our uh, model for an enterprise gravitational wave search. Um, we need to give the, um, the time span of the observations. This is going to be the same as the time span of that pulsar because we've only got one pulsar. So it's only 12.7 years, but that's roughly the time span of all of the observations anyway. So this gets us down to about two nanohertz or so in frequency sensitivity. We'll read in some more packages from, um, from an extension library called Enterprise Extensions. And then we'll read in the uh, MCMC sampler that we use. It's, um, it's mostly an in-house built MCMC sampler. We don't use popular ones like MC or Dynasty or other, you know, PyMC3 or something. We've pretty much tuned this for our own particular purposes. And, uh, and so it's, it's well suited to what we're trying to do. It's PTMCMC sampler, which means it's doing parallel tempering MCMC. 
to ensure that we get good convergence of our MCMT chains. Uh, don't worry about these warnings. They're not going to affect us. This is where we actually piece together the model. Okay, so let me describe how this model is pieced together. Um, we give it the list of pulsar objects you know, that we've constructed. Um, these can be held fixed. You don't need to worry about these. So just consider these as nuisance flags that you don't change. Uh, common PSD is the model we assume for the common spectrum process, the power spectral density of the common spectral process. Uh, and this is a power law, okay? Um, we've also got some noise that's individual to each pulsar that we also want to model as well. This is a low frequency nuisance red process that we have to model in each pulsar. We also allow that to be a power law. Uh, we read in the noise dictionary that I just spoke about. For our common spectrum process, we'll only model five frequencies because that's what was in the paper. That's what I've shown. So that's common components equals five. But for the individual red noise, we'll let there be 30 frequencies. And then the tilt, uh, the spectral index of this common spectrum process, I'm going to lock that to an assumption that I've got supermassive black hole binary. So that's what this 13 thirds is. If you remember from my presentation, this is the expected spectral slope for supermassive black hole binaries. If you wanted to, to lock this to a different slope, um, you can. If you wanted to assume a different theory that has a power law shape, you can do that. Um, it's relatively straightforward to modify this um, to, to actually put in your own completely custom spectral model if you wanted to. I'm not going to show that, but it is relatively straightforward. And if you want to know that, uh, let me know. But I will talk about a way you can bypass all of this to fit your models um, without constructing any of this stuff. So let's construct our PTA model. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, we've got nanograv um, observations of an individual pulsar could have like 10,000 time and observations. Um, and then we're correlating the 10,000 time and observations across all of the pulsars. So if we actually did this as one big time domain stochastic search, uh, we couldn't do it. It would. Uh, we couldn't actually compute a likelihood operation within a few seconds. It would. It would take a long time. So we have some some tricks to convert this into the time into the frequency domain, so we can do our operations faster there. This is why it's tractable because just thinking about it, it's um it's a huge it's a huge correlation analysis we're doing. This is going to form the sampling object. Um here so we're just going to tell it to put all of our mcmc chains and our metadata into this directory um if you wanted to stop or run and resume it you can do that that's what this flag is for so that's quite useful if you've got an analysis and you close down your laptop and you want to start it again provided that you've got this stored on on, on the cloud and you can resume it there's the output directory and you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to worry about this flag. Um, the output here is actually pretty important. In order to optimize our MCMC sampling over this parameter space that we're looking at, um, we put in some different proposal schemes for the MCMC draws into our cocktail of proposal schemes. One of those that's quite effective is drawing from the prior. So we've got a we've got a draw from the prior, and that's proposed as our next point in our MCMC sampling. And that's good to get our chain moving around parameter space and not getting stuck because we're trying to map out the full posterior probability distribution of all of our parameters. So we want good exploration. Let's draw an initial sample just from the prior of our observations. Okay. And then let's do our MCMC sampling. This should take about two minutes um, to do about 100,000 steps in an MCMC operation. Well, that's working. Um, let me remind you that in this analysis, we're, we're searching within timing residuals, which means that we allow there to be some deviations around the initial best fit of that timing solution. So we vary that. Um, we can also vary white noise parameters, but we've kept it fixed in the, in the notebook. 
And then we've got this red noise, this low frequency noise, part of which is intrinsic to each pulsar, just as a noise process. But then we might also have some uh, inter-pulsar correlated component that is the gravitational wave background. And if you're unfamiliar with red processes or time series, this is something that has, um, it's a stochastic process that has lots of power on low frequencies um, or equivalently long time scales in your observations. PTA likelihood, the, the time to evaluate um, the actual likelihood function for our analysis. Um, if you ignore the cross correlations between pulsars, then it's usually taking hundreds of a second. If you include the fact that the gravitational wave background is correlating all of our observations amongst all of our pulsars, it can take a few seconds. Um, but you know, as we add more pulsars, you'd expect this to get worse. But we're actually kind of static at the moment. We're, in, we're taking Murray's law into account, and it's uh, as we add more pulsars, this is not actually bloated to more than a few seconds. All right. Before I get back to the future of pulsar time and observations, let's just complete this notebook. This is almost done. Uh, and let me remind you, this is only one pulsar that we're looking at. Um, if I had included all 45 pulsars or even just the 23 pulsars that I explicitly named earlier that had more than six years, um, we'd have to spend the afternoon doing this. So you would go and get lunch or you go and do errands or something, or you'd put this onto your local cluster uh, and come back when it's done. You get the idea with just one, one pulsar. Okay, now that the run is complete, let's read in our MCMC chain that will contain um, rows that correspond to different MCMC samples. And those different MCMC samples will be random draws from the posterior probability distribution of our model. And the different columns will be the different parameters in our model. Um, we're going to chop off the first quarter of this chain because the thing about MCMCs is they're not perfect. Um, you still have to take a while to burn in to the Bayesian posterior distribution. So you usually cut off an initial section where it's, it's just starting to explore the parameter space. And then this will tell us the name of the actual parameters we've read in. Let's do that. It's important to do diagnostics on MCMC chains. This cell will show us, these are called trace plots. This basically shows the progression of the MCMC chain from one sample to the next. This is pretty good. This shows that we're carving out the same region of parameter space as we go to more and more iterations of our MCMC. If this was doing terribly, then it would be wandering and it would look like it hadn't locked on to any region in particular, but this is pretty good because it's only a few parameters. The one we actually care about is the amplitude of the gravitational wave background we're studying. And that looks like it has a nice peak in it. And that's one of the pieces of evidence from this pulsar that we've got a common spectrum red process. We've actually got something that's well localized. This histogram is the 1D marginalized posterior distribution for the amplitude of this common process. So let's just isolate that and look at this um, marginalized posterior probability distribution. So this is the amplitude called this gravitational waves here. That's cheating. It's not, we don't know it's gravitational waves, um, but it's this common spectrum red process. And we've only got an amplitude here because if you remember, I fixed the spectral index of that model. Okay, so this is just the amplitude uh, in strain space reference to a frequency of one over a year, which is about 32 nanohertz. And at that level, it's about um, two times 10 to the minus 15. This vertical line here is actually what's reported in Nanograph's paper. And so just with this one pulsar, we get um, pretty close to the published solution anyway. So it's pretty good. Um, the reason why we can say this is a detection of a common red process and not an upper limit is because this posterior probability distribution has diminishing support when you go down to lower and lower amplitudes. So it's actually localized in one particular region and it's not consistent with being down here at, uh, at values that are essentially zero in strain. And just using this one pulsar, what is the maximum of our posterior distribution? It's about minus 14.73 in log space, which translates to about 
1.7 to 1.9 times 10 to the minus 15. So it's pretty close. So just to discuss this part of the notebook, the posterior shows that there is some red process in our data. If we added more pulsars, then we'd have even more support. We'd have this, this long tail down to low values would effectively disappear. We wouldn't get any samples down there, which implies we'd get closed Bayesian incredible regions on this peak. And that corresponds to a detection of this. Now, the model we searched for was a common spectrum process across pulsars. It did not have the Hellings and Downs correlations imposed. And so we're not claiming we've detected gravitational waves. As I said earlier, if you did want to do this on multiple pulsars, it's as simple as modifying the cell, getting rid of this line, and then you collect all of the pulsars and you construct the model, you do the MCMC entirely as I've shown you so far. It just takes longer. Um, it takes longer because the likelihood takes longer, but also you're searching over more parameters uh, in your MCMC because you're searching over nuisance noise parameters in each pulsar and the background. So it takes longer for your MCMC to converge and lock on to the tree posterior. Um, so what if you didn't want to assume a particular spectral model? You probably don't care about binary black holes. You care about phase transitions, cosmic strings, all of that good stuff. Um, so what if you wanted a more agnostic model that was going to give you measurements of the power spectrum of gravitational waves at different frequencies, completely independently at different frequencies? Um, that's as simple as changing this model construction from being a power law to being just spectrum. Okay, so let's do that. So I've only changed this one keyword from power law to spectrum. Let's construct everything as before. I'm just giving it a different output directory for my MCMC chain files. And let's start something. Again, this will take about two minutes to run. And I think after I'm done with the notebook, there is still some more material to discuss, but probably everyone would appreciate a five or 10 minute break um, to get some coffee or snacks. Um, and if that's okay, we could come back and, and cover the last few slides. A lot of data analysis is staring at a screen, unfortunately. <laughs> Something I did mention actually was um, this, this number here, acceptance rate. Um, that's telling you how often a point you propose is being accepted by your MCMC chain. You don't want that to be 100%. Um, it's unlikely that it would be 100%, but you, you don't really want it to be that much because that implies that you're stuck in one tiny region of parameter space, maybe a global, you know, uh, sorry, a, a local maximum of your likelihood space. And so, of course, you're getting acceptance because you're at the top of the hill. Um, you don't want it to be zero either because you're probably proposing points that are very, very far away from the peak of your posterior. And so you're not getting acceptance. About 30 to 50% is your optimum. That's kind of like your, your Goldilocks scenario where it's just right. It's exploring parameter space. It's proposing points away from the peak. It's mapping out the full posterior, um, but you're not getting stuck. And Adding DE jump, that's uh, that's one of the schemes in our proposal cocktail. We have lots of different schemes to make this MCMC move around very well. Okay, so let's read in our chain file again. Remember, instead of just one amplitude of a power law, we've now got different amplitudes at different frequencies. So these are the these are the parameters we searched over. We've got the power law that describes the intrinsic red noise in this pulsar. But we've also got a parameter that encodes the strength of this putative gravitational wave signal at uh, the first five frequencies in our observations. 
So now this, this next plot will look probably very, fairly similar uh, to what you've seen before. This is a violin plot that's showing the Bayesian posterior distribution of the amplitude of this common process induced timing delay at different frequencies. This is one over the total baseline of observations, about two nanohertz or so. This is two times that, this is three times that, this is four times that. We're just going one over T, two over T, three over T, and how we sample the different frequencies. And actually a power law would fit fairly well here. Um, so wouldn't it be fantastic if you didn't have to jump through all of these hoops, construct these models yourself? Um, wouldn't it be great if you could just fit against this kind of Bayesian periodogram for your own spectral models, your own templates that you construct from your theories? Um, some papers have done that, um, but in in uh, not necessarily an optimized way because you need a high fidelity representation of this posterior distribution. Um, and so that's something that my research group at Vanderbilt is developing. We're, we're trying to essentially use these Bayesian periodograms as compressed forms of the data, because you probably don't care about the actual time and observations, you care about the amplitude of this spectrum at different frequencies. So we want to make this very easy. So you can just take these, uh, these representations, these kind of Bayesian violins and fit your own models against them uh, and get posterior distributions. So my grad student is writing this up, keep an eye out in the next couple of months um, because this should be almost trivial for you all to do um, once we have that software out. Uh, he's Welsh, so we call it Keffel, which is Welsh uh, for horse. It's fast, uh, just like this method. All right, and I won't go through the rest of this notebook because the rest of this notebook will actually um, allow you to download our, our true MCMC chains from our actual analysis that we did in the nanograph 12 and a half year data. So you can produce the actual figures that we have in the paper. You can do that yourself. Okay, so the rest of this would be just downloading our MCMC chains from our full production level analyses and producing the plots exactly as you see them in the paper. Um, that's the end of the tutorial section. I hope this has given you an idea of uh, it not being terribly difficult to run an analysis once you see the different steps. And if you want to tweak certain things, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so we can pause here, take a little break, and then I'll, uh, I'll finish off with slides whenever you think is appropriate. Yeah, um, take a break. 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. I can also take questions from anyone um, if there are any. So if you had a successful working, you're saying it would be the same way we use like a framework. Should I get some? Like just in a similar way that we use like like input in front. Yeah. Yeah. I mean this <clears throat> once this once we have this software ready for you, um, instead of taking in instead of your likelihood being constructed with timing data these objects will become your likelihood and just fit against those. So you're just evaluating the scores of a five dimensional distribution. Okay. But I mean, if you mentioned it has to be one constructing based on this. Uh, yeah, exactly. On these uh, funky shapes that are in the center. Yeah, exactly. So it's no longer gassing, you just have to construct some sort of good representation of maybe a five dimensional. Uh, arbitrary distribution. And once, say, you propose a model, your mm -hmm. model is and frequency right. space will intersect these, and you just score where it right, right. And that's going to give you results that are equivalent to everything you've done about that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. How do you pronounce it? Careful. Careful. I'm, I'm not. I'm Irish. I'm not Welsh. Uh -huh. <laughs> he says it's careful. Careful. Yeah. Oh. Um, all right. For that. Okay. Okay, thanks for your uh, yeah. talk. Yeah, I actually had a, a little detailed question uh, about the, the phosphor timing formula, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which deals with the binary on uh, when the phosphor is in a binary system. Mm -hmm. And maybe it will have some corrections and, yeah. uh, from, from, from the GR effect. Right. So, so I, I want to know a little more about this this part. So do, okay. do you have any suggestions? Um, for resources for you to learn about this sort of thing or just how it affects our gravitational researches? Uh, 
uh, about the resources about yeah. this. Um, if you'd like to, if you'd like to learn about this, actually the best resource. Um, sorry, a lot of slides here. Um, so there's a there's a book by Lorimer and Kramer. Um, that is called the Handbook of Pulsar Time and Astronomy. Sorry, Handbook of Pulsar Astronomy, and that has that has a ton of details of how you construct these timing models, uh, the different binary effects. Yes. Um, there's also uh, if I get rid of this. an old piece of timing software that's called Tempo 2. And um, this has details of how you construct a timing model, including binary effects um, to describe the, you know, how do things change because you've got precession of the orbit? How do things change when you've got Shapiro delay within the yes. binary system? It's actually, it's all in actually I, I once worked with these effects, like oh, Shapiro yeah. Yeah. and Einstein delays. Yes, yes, because because I, I want to know if there is any new effects added in in this program. Um, that's yeah, uh, because because these two effects I think maybe the the eighties last centuries were were already in inside. Yeah, yeah. I so I don't think if we did add more corrections, then they would be small and they would not affect our gravitational waves. Importantly, the the, the binary orbital periods of the pulsar systems are um, they're much smaller periods than the periods of the gravitational waves we're looking for. So if you went to the spectrum of gravitational waves, um, binary orbital effects would be up here um, oh. at higher frequencies, whereas we think we're mostly sensitive oh, yes. down here. Because we are, we are searching very low frequencies. Exactly, yeah. of the scale of years to decades. Um, but it's the time and model of each pulsar is refined and updated. So Shapiro delay may not be immediately detectable, obviously. And so you add that, that's a correction as you go on. Um, I don't know of any further corrections that yeah. might be might be added in. Um, yeah, actually, because because my background is is about searching for the ultra cold dark matter. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. yes. Yes. We are considering the system that the, the ultra cold the dark matter, the ultra light dark matter yeah. was. Uh, formed around a black hole, uh, which may right. form a gravitational like, black hole. Oh, okay. Okay. So in, in, in such a system, maybe there will be a large mass problem. Right. Yeah. But that wouldn't, <laughs> that, would, that kind of cloud wouldn't couple to a neutron star. Uh, they, they will couple to a neutron star, but they, but they, they couple to the black hole. So the, um, uh, uh, what we want to do is when the, those black holes and Another pulsar forms a uh, binary. Oh, okay. so we can we can read the signals from a single single pulsar. Yeah, well, that, that would be that would be amazing. Yes. To, get, to get a, we don't have any black holes obviously. So, uh, in, in, we don't have any of these pulsars in black hole systems. Oh, um, yeah. because that would be an amazing test of our relative. I, I completely agree. Um, our pulsars are all in binary systems with any other neutron stars or other or white dwarfs or. Maybe there are companion main signal stars, I'm not sure. But no, we don't have black holes yet, of course. But once we do, yes, I agree that we're more interested. So I'm very interested in the such new events. Okay, fantastic. Would you like me to send um, those resources on Slack or something? Or... Oh, oh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, they're just, uh, it's just this link and this link. So I'll send it on the Slack. Uh, 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 are you on the? Um, but maybe I am not in this slide. Okay. So, uh, may I write my email? Yeah, of course. Um, um, okay. Uh, well, I'll just send you an email right now. I'm going to type in your email address. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for a nice talk. Oh, yeah, of course. Pleasure. Way up at the top, yeah, like when there's file view. Somehow I don't see that in yours, maybe because, yeah, tools, uh, settings, miscellaneous. Okay. I'm going to choose getting. It'll all be good. Maybe it's because this automatic saving failed for some reason. I don't know. Let me increase the power. <laughs> I think the power just means how fast they walk. <laughs> no, but somehow, why is it not showing up? Sorry. That's okay. No, it must be must be because of the save and fail or something. Yeah. It's just not working correctly. If you open a different cola, just a cola. Yeah. So it will start a new instance, right? Uh, yeah, let's do this. Where are my corgis? I am not. I don't have it saved on my. Oh. It could be. Maybe maybe it's because I have. Do you think it's because I have ad blocker? Yeah. Oh no, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it takes a little bit of time, but <laughs> <laughs> then I think it will also show up in your other one. That's amazing. Real, real. <laughs> Oh, there we go. And the specific instances are drawn from some MCMC, so they're not the same as you see. <laughs> There's a whole spectrum of this. Yeah. <laughs> they're competing with each other. <laughs> so the, the paper you were mentioning with catching during the night, so andrea means i know him very well oh you did okay. yeah. so i mean now he is at daisy he's like most of yeah. before that he was a Catholic. i didn't actually know he moved yeah. he did he did okay. um but he did his phd at, uh, in italy he's italian in Sun, and that's where i was most of oh, okay. here so i know him super well we wrote like we were right. and, uh, that's great yeah he's um I think he got involved, got interested in the retirement work because Cap Kaplan was interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now he's he's um, he's gone beyond that. He's just doing lots of researches himself, and he's leading one of the what we're calling that non-black hole search for gravitational waves in our most recent data set. I see. So he's, he's part of the collaboration. Yeah, he's an associate. Good thing. You want to get a flower? Uh, can we not? Do we have to master? I'm not going to put any effort. I, I, you do it. I will do it. Okay. You want to do it or not? Well, 
Actually, it's more relevant for what it's if you guys want to organize another thing. It's so, so the, yeah. is it common practice to get I mean, gifts for all the administrative people uh, wherever a workshop is hosted? I don't think it's, I've seen it done. I don't think it's, it's not, just, it's not a problem. Yes, you don't have to do okay. it. I mean, I can see it, I've seen it done at uh, more formal workshops. Yeah. But this is sort of an informal, it's not a, I don't think you have to do it. Okay. You don't want to. Okay. Do okay. You don't need to give people like a bottle of champagne or something. Okay. You don't have to. Or I'll find something like very small, but I won't. I won't look for like this. You can amaze. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> If we're going to get started, yeah, I, I, I will use the, the beautiful device. Ah, yes. Okay, um, so there are, there are two important things I wanted to mention uh, before we go any further. The first is that I was just taught a very important lesson about Google Collaboratory and that you can get it to have kittens walk across the top. <laughs> Um, you can have corgis as well. There might have been another option, but crab. Crab. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Um, the, uh, the second there thing. Example from MCMC. So as you see, there is a whole variety of tools, settings, uh, miscellaneous corgis. They might. There we go. Okay. Anyway, um, so. It'll help you work. It'll calm you as you code. Uh, the other thing was um, phase transitions. I forgot to show you this. So uh, as part of the Nanograph 12 and a half year phase transition constraints, um, the corresponding author, who was Andrea Mitridati, actually produced this nice um, book, uh, Interactive Phase Transition Spectrum. So um, I'll give you the link to this uh, at the end of the presentation. but. You can launch this um, binder instance. This might take a minute to launch, but it effectively is a nice uh, interactive spectrum where you can toggle the different properties of your phase transition and see how that um, aligns or no longer aligns with the actual measured uh, common spectrum power values that Nanograph is measured. So we'll see how long this takes. I don't think it'll take very long.
All right. Okay, in classic live demo example, it's taken longer than expected and not loading. But if it comes up, I'll show you at the end of the presentation. Let's get back to um, some of the future prospects. So I've told you what we searched for and how we search for it. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the road ahead and when we might actually be able to get a detection of gravitational waves. And by detection, I mean, we actually pull out those cross correlations um, so this is some work that was led by my postdoc at, at Vanderbilt, uh, Nihan Paul, who showed that um, after we get to about 16, 15 to 16 years, we'll have enough evidence in the cross correlations um, to actually claim a detection. And we think that given nanograph's current sen sensitivity and the number of pulsars that it has, and the fact that it's expanding its array of modern pulsars, that only a few extra years beyond its, its most recent data set is necessary. And that's good news because we're working on a 16 year data set, which is an addition of three years of, of observations and adds more than 20 new pulsars to the array. So we think with this newly constructed data set that we're working on, uh, we should have um, the ability to discriminate one way or the other whether we actually have gravitational waves. Um, if, if we truly have gravitational waves in there, and uh, say we say we analyze and try to determine whether it's uh, correlated with the Hellings and Downs curve or it's correlated with some other um, incorrect systematic signature, then like I said, part of part of our detection process is not an instantaneous Eureka detection. It's a story over a period of time and we can track the growth of the signal to noise in the cross correlations and you know match that against our expectations. So it's as much about looking at the growth of our significance over time as it is about getting just that breakthrough detection. Um, once we get the detection of cross correlations, by that point, we'll have also good characterization of the spectrum of gravitational waves. And we can tell you how well we'll be able to measure the amplitude in the background and the precision with which we'll be able to get um, the, the spectral index, that tilt. Um, and so this is all reference to some scalings on what we call the total signal to noise ratio. So this is not just the signal to noise in the cross correlations, it's the signal to noise ratio of all of the information in the array, which includes the autocorrelations of the pulsars themselves. So actually the cross correlations are fairly weak when compared to the autocorrelations. So you get a lot of spectral information from the autocorrelations. Um, this is where Nanograph currently is with its 12 and a half year data set. Um, once we get to about our new data set, which is 16 years of observations, um, we should get down to about 40% precision level on both the amplitude and that spectral index. Um, we are continually adding new pulsars and new timing data. This can get very, very expensive. Um, as I've told you, um, it can take several seconds to do these, to do these uh, likelihood evaluations. And it just gets worse and worse as we as we expand our arrays. Um, part of that is because we're correlating many time and observations within a pulsar and then across different pulsars as well. So our pulsar time and array covariance matrix is gigantic. Um, along the diagonal here, when you correlate a pulsar with itself, you suffer from white noise, low frequency noise in the individual pulsars. And the reason why we rely on the cross correlation so much is because noise is not going to be correlated between different pulsars, but our signal is, and that's where the gravitational wave will lie. Nevertheless, I did say that uh, the cross correlations are weak compared to the outer correlations, the diagonal terms in this covariance matrix. And so if we're just interested in, say, spectral characterization, if you wanted to fit a model um, from a particular theory against the spectrum, then you'd get most of the information from, from this diagonal term. So why don't we just get rid of those for the time being. Well, imagine we've already detected the background. And so we, we can be confident that what we're looking at is gravitational waves. And we just want spectral information, which is mostly hiding 
within this autocorrelation term. Once you do that, the, the likelihood essentially factorizes into a per pulsar operations. So it's just a product over different pulsars with uh, some common signal within them. This is actually how we model that common spectrum process. We ignore the correlations. We just model it as a spectrally common signal uh, in the different pulsars. And this is called the factorized likelihood technique. This is something that I developed uh, a while ago. It parallelizes the operations. So once you add a new pulsar, you don't have to redo everything. You just tack it on to the end. And so it's a par trivially parallelizable technique for uh, constraining the amplitude of the stochastic background. You can compute um, base factors and odds ratios that are have really huge contrasts. So this is a measurement of this common spectrum process with a Bayesian odds ratio of 65,000 to one. That's what we reported in the nanograph 12 and a half year paper. Um, we can actually then vary some of those fixed white noise parameters that I talked about. It's, no, it's not really expensive to vary those when you do everything parallelized, so we can do that easily. Um, this, is, this is Keffel, that software that I was telling you about that we're developing. Um, again, there's a Star Trek theme here. This is, this is the next generation because we're going to produce this software that can fit against these, uh, these posterior violins um, so that you don't have to do all of this work, get into this stage and just take this, um, this compressed representation of the data or compressed representation of, of the likelihood and score your model against where it intersects these Bayesian posterior distributions. And so you'll get equivalent results. This is a full PTA pipeline in red that takes a while. And then this is um, GFL. Another reason why I called it Kethel is because if you can make it sound like GFL, which is the generalized factorized likelihood. And the Bayesian posterior distribution looks almost equivalent to what happens when you do the full, the full likelihood. So this is trivial. It takes no time at all. If you wanted to fit a model, um, it would take you a couple of minutes to do, and literally a, two minutes rather than um, days and days, which it currently takes. The fact that this is flexible and fast would allow you to do lots of different things. You know, not only could you constrain um, your your own theories, you could also search for multiple astrophysical signals and cosmological backgrounds um, and constrain your favorite model with minimal fuss. Um, we're also interested in characterizing spatial correlations, those cross correlations between different pulsars. If we take that Hellings and Downs curve and we decompose the curve onto the Legendre polynomials, um, we will get this blue spectrum here. So this is this is the different multipoles of the Legendre uh, polynomials. Um, like I said, the Hellings and Downs curve is mostly L equals two. It's mostly quadrupolar. Um, it has actually no overlap with a monopole or a dipole, which is great. Um, there is still some power in the octopole and beyond. So this is more evidence that the Hellings and Downs curve is not entirely quadrupolar. It's got a little bit of octopole and beyond. Um, and as time goes on, we'll be able to constrain the different multipolar coefficients to even greater degrees and, and be able to say, look at how modified gravity theories beyond GR theories will produce different Legendre spectra and how well we, could, we can constrain those. Um, this is something that another, another of my students is working on. He's trying to actually analyze the, the spatial correlations on a per frequency basis so that um, perhaps some theories um, or some models will predict different structure at different frequencies. And that's something we constrain. This is also fantastic if we want to constrain anisotropy in the gravitational wave background. I know that was discussed um, today and yesterday. Um, so, in an astrophysical gravitational wave background composed of binaries, for example, you'd expect that you would get different structure, different angular power at different frequencies. There's no reason to expect that the binaries that are at one frequency bin would be related to binaries at a different frequency bin. These are essentially monochromatic and independent signals at different frequency bins. So you'd have a different view of the gravitational wave sky in different bins. And by probing the and by probing deviations from the Hellings and Downs curve, you can actually probe angular structure in the gravitation sky. So we can parameterize deviations away from this curve and reconstruct hotspots and structure and entire angular power spectrum of the sky at different frequencies. Now, say you wanted to search for multiple backgrounds, an astrophysical foreground of binaries, plus maybe a cosmological background that predicts anisotropy. 
Um, that's something you could do here as well. You just do component separation and uh, model those things simultaneously. Or perhaps if your, your theory of the early universe predicts that it's a completely isotropic background, that's even more leverage because binary backgrounds would certainly not be isotropic. There's no reason why they would be isotropic. Um, we've recently produced some constraints on when we could um, when we could actually discriminate the presence of anisotropy in the gravitational wave background. So these curves are representing decision thresholds in the angular power spectrum. Um, if the measured anisotropy in the different multipoles exceeds these curves, so is greater than the level of these curves, then we'd be in tension with isotropy at the three sigma level. So um, that's not saying that we have anisotropy necessarily, but um, sort of the opposite of isotropy is anisotropy, right? So if you're in tension with isotropy, it's tacit uh, evidence of anisotropy. Um, so this is showing that these decision thresholds get um, lower and lower um, as time goes on, which means that it'll be easier to discriminate the presence of anisotropy. Yep. Um, Yes. Yep. So you'd imagine that there's there's absolutely no you know connection or correlation between binaries in one part of the sky and the other. And once you get beyond a few hundred megaparsecs, the actual positional distribution is homogeneous. But you're dealing with a population of binaries that have different masses and they're different distances. And so the, the gravitational wave power is anisotropic, even though the positional distribution of binaries may be mostly isotropic, okay? So it's about the actual emission anisotropy of gravitational waves rather than a positional distribution. Um, so if we, can, if we can measure that, we'll be able to construct a map of where the binaries are. And the next goal would be to slowly see these regions localize on one part of the sky. Um, and that would be early evidence of an individual binary that might be resolving out of the confusion background. So it might show up as extreme anisotropy in one part of the sky, first of all, and then um, over time, it might actually become resolvable as a deterministic signal that we can use matched filtering on. Um, and then the fun begins where we try to localize that to a particular galaxy, but the localization regions, as we discussed earlier, are potentially hundreds of square degrees. So you need some strategies to try to whittle down the kinds of galaxies that could host these uh, supermassive binaries, which might not be terribly difficult because these are the most massive black holes in the universe. So the galaxies would also be gigantic and uh, probably quite red uh, as well. So um, that's basically the end. I wanted to convey that we've got this um, thing that we call a common spectrum process, something that is low frequency um, that is spectrally consistent amongst many pulsars has been confirmed by uh, different independent pulsar time and array collaborations. Um, and if this is the gravitational wave background, then we're on track to detect um, those definitive spatial correlations in the next few years. Um, after that, we'll do detailed spectral characterization and start to tease apart signatures of uh, you know, the structure of the binary population and, and dig within that to look for cosmological signals. Um, after we look in the background, we'll, we'll also try to resolve individual sources, and perhaps some of these individual binary sources will have corresponding electromagnetic signatures, which would be very, very exciting. Um, so thank you very much for listening. There's the, the link to the book, uh, um, the, the book uh, web app. And I actually just held a two-week summer school uh, at Vanderbilt on Pulsar Time and Array. So if you'd like to access even more resources, um, you can go to that link there. Um, again, thank you very much for listening. Happy to answer any questions. You can also see if the book of thing actually finished. There we go. Okay. Um, so say you wanted to lower the temperature of the phase transition. There you go. It's shifting that peak around. Um, these points and error bars are representing those nanograph measurements of this common spectrum process. Um, say you wanted to change the bubble nucleation rate, uh, strength of the phase transition, and then the, I think this is the velocity of uh, the bubble walls. And you can change whether you use the semi-analytic spectrum, the numerical spectrum. Um, these are representing bubble only 
uh, signals or sound wave only signals. So this is this is representing the models that were used in the paper to search and constrain phase transition properties. Um, yeah, and if you've never used Boca, it's, it's pretty nifty for creating these kinds of interactive tutorials. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was just looking at the information. Do you have any questions? So, um, yeah, do you see this? Do you have any large? So, I just believe, like, if we were from there, let's spend some money. Um, let's see. If we were to compare, so, so, CL here is is the actual kind of uh, angular power spectrum. It's it's I'm sure it's defined exactly as you're you're thinking about it. It's sort of like the sum over the amplitude squared in a given L normalized by four pi. I think. Um, so if you if you wanted to look at that level and compare it to um, what we might be able to detect in higher multiples compared to the monopole, then anything. Um, above 30 percent of the monopole we could discriminate um, at about 20 years of observation so once we get to once we get to 20 years of observations which will happen in about four to five years we'll be able to resolve um, any angular structure uh, in the power spectrum that's greater than 30 percent of the monopole That's a great question. So um the question was, do is there is there an independent way to verify that the gravitational wave where background we're seeing actually comes from black holes or some other source. Um, so <clears throat> the, the strongest evidence I think will probably come from individual system detections. So if we actually do measure an individual binary black hole and we have a corresponding electromagnetic signature for that, that's sort of a slam dunk, obviously. Um, it's a more it's a more challenging statistical argument for the stochastic background, I think. And it doesn't matter which gravitational wave detector you talk about. Um, a stochastic background is just a different beast, and it's, it's more challenging to to convince um, because it is statistical in nature rather than being able to see the merger waveform. Um, I think th there have been studies where you take all of these electromagnetic counterparts um, or or alleged periodic quasar systems that have been found in time domain surveys and you add up all of the gravitational wave signals that those produce and you also kind of simulate a, a binary population based on the statistics of those detected events and you kind of fabricate a binary black hole background conditioned on those candidate events and that has already told us that if we construct a background like that we would have detected it already, which means that not all of those candidates are real. So that's a, that's a nice argument, I think, because it's kind of reductio ad absurdum. You're, you're constructing a background based out of all of these candidates, and then you find that if those were true candidates, you would have detected the gravitational wave signal. Um, so I think we'll we'll make arguments based like that. Um, I think it'll be challenging to say that it's not a black hole origin. Um, we, we at least have uh, an idea that the black holes would be the first detected events. Um, but we're studying how well, how far into the future we'll need to go before we can resolve, uh, you know, primordial signatures or early universe gravitational wave signals, which have different contrast levels to the binary black hole background. That kind of study has already been done for LISA, as far as I'm aware. Um, and it's starting to be done in pulsar time array. So we don't have a definitive answer yet, like how small that that early universe signature can be for it to be still detectable. Um, so it's, it's ongoing work. 
how much of the analysis for the tie has been some shape for description of the Um or free floating type shape analysis. Yeah, the free floating type shape analysis is is this sort of thing, where we you know we in our in our Bayesian searches in the notebook that we went through the last thing that we did was to not assume that we've got a power law strain spectrum you just have a parameter that is the power in one frequency bin and then another frequency bin so it's completely flexible and then that's essentially just an agnostic recovery and then you can fit it against that agnostic recovery whatever one would want. Um, so, uh, we were uh, talking about this as a question I saw. She said that uh, at some point you start to realize it was wrong to do the binary. Yes. Um, how, how much data do you do that and how to work this piece? So, with our existing data, the, the question was um, when can we start to, when can we start to resolve individual events, we think? Um, we think we'll be in a position to resolve individual events by the end of this decade, based on some uh, mock data challenges we've done. Because you not only have to take into account the, the noise in your, your pulsars and the noise in your detector, the gravitational wave background itself from the rest of the binary population is a form of self-noise to the individual signal that you're trying to detect. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough data analysis problem. Um, and it'll it'll slowly resolve out of the confusion background. Um, localization will still be very poor, even at the threshold detection. Um, but we think we'll be able to get a threshold signal to noise of about five by the end of this decade for a large a large binary black hole would be of the order of ten to the nine solar masses. That's reasonably close by, so within about um, a gigaparsec. We've already been able to rule out um, 10 to the, any 10 to the 10 solar mass binary black holes within 5.5 gigaparsecs. And we can rule out 10 to the nine solar masses, uh, solar mass black holes within about 120 megaparsecs. So as more data gets added, we're able to kind of rule out the presence of any binaries within a certain horizon volume. Sort of uh, I guess very much in the, the binary phase. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I should. I, I chuckled there because this is not a this is not a tough thing to model in PTAs. Um, we're in we're in the very early adiabatic and spiral states. So this waveform is a sine wave. <laughs> we, there's, we're probably unlikely to ever see any in spiral within the observations that we have within about twenty years of observations. So we, we don't have to get into, we don't need to model the spin of black holes. Um, it really is kind of leading order gravitational wave emission that we can model and resolve. Uh, at some point in the future, we might be able to resolve, you know, orbital precession or spin effects, but that's farther into the future. Um, while we're talking about this, I think uh, an interesting thing to mention is there are two parts to the gravitational wave signal from an individual binary entering our detector uh, scheme. And that's, um, you get a measurement of gravitational waves whenever the wave passes the pulsar, and then a measurement when the wave passes the Earth. And it's the it's the Earth part that is common in phase to all of the pulsars, because it's jiggling all, it's jiggling, you know, this part of the interferometer arm, which is at the Earth. But then there's this lag time corresponding to this initial pulsar effect. And so you get you get um, an envelope uh, on top of the waveform that corresponds to the gravitational wave signal potentially thousands of years in the past because that's the light travel time between the pulsar and the Earth. And so it's almost like we can do temporal aperture synthesis because we get the Earth. We call this the Earth term. It's common, but then we get lots of different snippets of the binary's orbital evolution from different stages corresponding to the light travel time between the different pulsars of the Earth. And if we can pull that up, even though we've only got, say, 20 years of observations or a few decades of observations, um, we can stitch those, those pulsar effects together and um, map the orbital evolution of a binary for thousands of years, potentially. Now, that, that requires us to have 
pretty good measurements of the distance of the pulsars from the Earth. And I said a while ago, we don't have that. So um, it's it's very dependent on us being able to model and get better distances. So the other way around, that the model the distance. Yeah. Yeah, you, if you if you had a strong gravitational wave signal from an individual source, then you could you could definitely do independent measurement of pulsar distances. Oh, did you say stand, standard candle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, but it's sort of um, the only analogy I can think of might be in in Lisa, where there are so many white dwarf systems that it'll be sensitive to that you can effectively map out the shape of the galaxy. Um, potentially, we could we could measure better distances to pulsars with individual binary detections. All right. Again, thanks for your attention. And I'm on Slack. So if there are any more questions or you want to follow up, let me know.